Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to present the guideline on the management of space occupying brain infarction on behalf of all authors whom you can find on this slide. These are my disclosures and the disclosures of the other authors can be found in the online supplement to the guideline, which will, will be published shortly. This guideline is to inform the care for patients like Mr. A, who was previously healthy and on a bad day woke up with a left-sided hemiplegia and hemianopia caused by an infarct in his right hemisphere caused by a right M1 occlusion. And based on CT perfusion criteria, he was not eligible for intravenous stromolysis or endovascular treatment. And just over a day later, he was found with a reduced consciousness and his right pupil was dilated and fixed. And this is his CT scan um, one hour later, which showed a large space occupying infarct in the territory of the right middle cerebral artery and also that of the anterior cerebral artery. And the question in this patient is, should we offer surgical decompression? And we transformed this question into the first PICO, which reads, in patients with space occupying hemispheric infarction, aged 18 up to and including 60 years, does surgical decompression initiated within 48 hours of stroke onset, as compared to no surgical decompression, reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. And we defined poor outcome as a score on a modified Rankin scale of four to six. And all recommendations are based on information from randomized trials. And we found seven of these trials um, addressing this question, including a total of 217 patients. And most well, surprisingly, surgical decompression reduced the risk of death by an absolute 44%. And it also reduced the risk of a poor outcome by an absolute 19%. But it also led um, to an absolute increase in the risk of survival with moderately severe or severe uh, handicap by 25%. So based on this information, we recommend surgical decompression to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. But of course, surgery should only be done after a shared decision process, including a careful discussion with the patient or his or her representatives about the risk of survival with substantial disability. This was um, pretty easy, but what about uh, Mrs. B, uh, who had a large infarct in the territory of the left middle cerebral artery and also the anterior cerebral artery? And she had a complete um, dysphagia and a right-sided hemiplegia. Should we offer her surgical decompression? We used information from a recently published uh, individual patient data meter analysis actually published um, just a few months ago, which found no difference in the benefits of surgical decompression between patients who had an aphasia here and in patients who did not have aphasia. So we concluded that the benefit of surgical decompression does not depend on the absence or presence of aphasia. And as already mentioned, both Mr. A and Mrs. B also had infarcts in the um, territory of the anterior cerebral artery. So is the benefit of surgical decompression dependent on these additional infarcts? Also for this question, we used information from the um, recently published individual patient data, data meta-analysis, which found no difference in benefit of surgical decompression between patients. Um, who did, did have involvement of an additional flow territory versus patients who had uh, an infarct in the territory of the middle cerebral artery alone. So here we conclude that the benefits of surgical decompression does not depend 
on the presence of an infarct in the territory of the anterior or posterior cerebral artery, in addition to that uh, of the middle cerebral artery. So the next PICO, this addresses patients who present later than 48 hours. And the question is, is surgical decompression also of benefit to these patients? We found there's two trials that address this question in both uh, Head First and Hamlet. Patients could be included um, later than 48 hours, but there were just 34 patients who fulfilled uh, this criterion. And in these patients, surgical decompression did not reduce the risk of death, but there were fewer deaths in these patients as compared to patients who present earlier. And surgical decompression did also not reduce the risk of a poor outcome. But again, the number of patients was very small. So we conclude that there's continued uncertainty about the benefit and risk uh, of the use of surgical decompression as a means to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. But um, based on um, expert consensus, we think that surgical decompression should also be considered later than 48 hours after stroke onset, if based on clinical grounds, death due to herniation appears likely. The next um, issue, Mr. C, 72 years, also has a space occupying infarct, in this case, in his left hemisphere. Should we offer him surgical decompression? This was the um, relevant PICO. And we found four trials that addressed this question, including a total of 232 patients. And also in these older patients, patients older, uh, uh, of 61 years or older, surgical decompression reduced the risk of death by an absolute 42%. But it had no um, statistically significant effect on the risk of a poor outcome. And also in these patients, surgical decompression increased the risk uh, of survival with moderately severe or severe handicap by an absolute 19%. So based on this information, we suggest to consider surgical decompression to reduce the risk of death and not of that, that of a poor outcome. But again, surgery should only be done after a shared decision process, including a careful discussion with the patient or his or her representatives about the risk of survival with substantial disability. Mrs. D, she has an infarct uh, in her cerebellum, a space occupying infarct and a developing hydrocephalus. What are the treatment options for her? Um, we wondered whether in patients with space occupying cerebellar infarction, does surgical decompression as compared to no surgical decompression reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome? We performed a literature search and found no randomized trials addressing this question, but um, observational studies suggested better outcomes with surgery. So that we therefore concluded that there's continued uncertainty about the benefits and risk of surgical decompression as a means to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. But we do suggest considering surgical decompression with or without CSF drainage in selected patients with space occupying cerebellar infarction, such as those with a reduced consciousness caused by brainstem infarction. But unfortunately, the precise selection of patients and the optimal timing of treatment remain uncertain. And there's certainly insufficient evidence to support its routine use. And what about CSF drainage? We performed a literature search, found no randomized trials and no high quality observational studies. So we concluded again that there's continued uncertainty about the benefit and risk of CSF drainage as a means to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome in patients with space occupying cerebellar infarction. But we suggest considering CF, as CSF drainage alone or combined with surgical decompression in selected patients with space occupying cerebellar infarction and signs of an obstructive hydrocephalus, such as in those with a reduced consciousness. 
And again, the selection of patients and the optimal timing of treatment remain uncertain. There's insufficient evidence to support this routine use. And of course, we have several medical treatment options, osmotic therapy, hyperventilation, corticosteroids, sedation, hypothermia, and glyburide. And for the first four, we found no randomized uh, trial and also no convincing evidence of benefits from other studies. And for glyburide, we found one inconclusive phase two randomized trial. So based on this information, we suggest against the use of corticosteroids or glyburide in routine clinical practice. And we also su uh, suggest against the routine use of osmotic therapy, hyperventilation or sedation as a means to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. However, short-term therapy may be considered as a rescue procedure. Then the last PICO, in patients with space-occupying hemispheric infarction, does hypothermia as compared to no hypothermia reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome? We found four randomized trials in, uh, addressing this question, including a total of 140 patients. And we found that uh, hypothermia does not reduce the risk of death in these trials. And has also no effect on the risk of a poor outcome, but the numbers were small. We therefore suggest against the use of hypothermia in routine clinical practice as a means to reduce the risk of death or a poor outcome. Of course, there are several other issues, um, the size of the hemicraniectomy, whether you can perform surgical decompression uh, for space occupying hemisphere, uh, hemorrhagic transformation of an infarct, monitoring of intracranial pressure and admission to uh, an intensive care unit. But in the interest of time, um, I will not discuss these issues and you can uh, read about this in the guideline. Um, what does require uh, discussion is that the evidence supporting most management options for patients with space occupying uh, brain infarction is very limited. Of course, with the exception of surgical decompression within the first 48 hours. And we therefore encourage our colleagues, including you, to start randomized trials or high quality observational studies in this field so that the future versions of these guidelines can be based on better evidence. Thank you for your attention.